Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to uh, Greater Portland Landmarks uh, lecture series this season. Uh, my name is Hillary Bassett. I'm Executive Director of Landmarks and I'm very happy to welcome all of you this evening. Thanks for coming out in the dead of winter for some uh, great opportunity to hear from three uh, people who are veteran historic preservationists who can share their insights with you. Before we start, I just wanted to remind you of Greater Portland Landmarks' mission, which is to re uh, preserve and revitalize the architectural fabric, history, and character of Greater Portland, renewing our neighborhoods, spurring economic development, and keeping Portland one of the most livable cities in America. I want to thank you for joining us, and I also would like to, before we begin, do a, pre a, a good promotion for membership. If you aren't already a member of Landmarks, most of you are, but we'd like to invite those of you who are not to join us, and you can get information at the table where you checked in. Also, we have some fabulous 50th anniversary note cards, which are available, and these are six scenes of Portland done by uh, an artist who many of you know, Peter Rolf, who's a, who's a great artist who's done many scenes of the Old Port, Custom House, uh, downtown Portland and some of the great houses in the city. I'd also like to um, encourage you to come back and take a look at the uh, exhibition, Images of Change, uh, Portland, Images of Portland since 1960. It's a really wonderful exhibition. Bruce Brown, one of the jurors, is here this evening. And I think they've done a great job selecting uh, photographs that show how Portland really has evolved from that toppling of Union Station in 1961, the evolution of the waterfront, the East End, downtown Portland. Uh, there's so many images that really are evocative of Portland's uh, development. And I also want to thank the Quimby Family Foundation and Maine Arts Commission for making that exhibition possible, as well as the Portland Public Library. And then this lecture tonight is also made possible by the library and Ocean Gate Realty, which is our sponsor for the lecture series. And then our 50th, it's part of our 50th anniversary, which is a great series of programs, the exhibition, the lecture series. This summer we'll be having some special tours. There's a lecture by Morrison Heckscher from the Metropolitan Museum of Art coming up in April. The whole series is sponsored by the Dead River Company, who's our lead sponsor, and also J.B. Brown and & Sons, and the Danforth Group of Wells Fargo Advisors and an anonymous donor. So thanks to all of them, we're able to uh, present a series of special programs this year for you. I'd also like to mention a, a publication. For those of you who are very long-term landmarks people, you remember the advisory service has been doing on-site visits at homes and properties throughout the greater Portland area for almost the entire existence of our 50, 50 years. They've got a new book out called Living with Newer Old Houses. And we have a few copies available also for you to, to look at and buy, if you'd like, uh, out at the desk. Now, the last thing I want to mention before we start is that we have another lecture in this series. And the speaker of that lecture is here tonight. Deb Andrews just walked in. And that is going to be on February 25th on the Portland's Historic Preservation Program and its Impact on Portland's Historic Neighborhoods, February 25th here at the Rhines Auditorium. Now I'm going to introduce our speakers, and as I was saying earlier, you couldn't have three better people to talk about the preservation movement in Portland. And uh, all coming from different angles, all with lots of experience to share with us, and, uh, and they all live in, uh, well, almost all of them. Uh, one works in Portland most of the time, and the others live in Portland. So we're lucky to have such experts here in our midst. First, I'm going to introduce Lee Urban. Uh, Lee was born in Portland, and he's considered the city's home all his life. Uh, he's raised four children here, uh, several cats, two dogs, and lived in the same historic house since 1976 in the West End. He's had many careers, and I have to say, Lee is, I totally admire someone who's able to, to do so many different things. He's been a real estate lawyer, nonprofit consultant, executive director of an AIDS lodging house, corporate officer, mediator. He was director of the planning and development department for the city of Portland, and now is an elementary school teacher. So Lee is taking on challenges anywhere they come from. <laughs> And he sort of served on a lot of <laughs> community boards, uh, including Greater Portland Landmarks and the, uh, the First Historic Preservation Board in Portland. And he says, and I love this, that you, you consider Landmarks Board 
or one of the most interesting and exciting boards you've ever been on. So that's wonderful. Chris Kloss, who's sitting next to Lee, um, joined Landmarks and Maine Preservation in July 2009 as our field services representative, serving all the communities of Maine, including the greater Portland region, with advice on historic preservation. He has over 30 years of experience as a consultant in planning, preservation, and community development to municipalities, government agencies, private and institutional clients. His expertise integrates historic preservation and community planning, including an adaptive use of historic commercial and industrial structures and innovative approaches to downtown revitalization. Chris is a graduate of the University of Vermont Master's Program in Historic Preservation, formerly served on the Northeast Regional Office of the National Trust, and founded his own company based in New Hampshire. And actually, Chris lives in New Hampshire, but commutes to Portland every week, so we're lucky to have him here. He started his own business in 1979. And then finally, Pam Hawks. Uh, Pam is a principal with Scatter Good Design, a new firm here in Portland, Maine. She has a particular interest in new interpretations of historic sites for contemporary lives. Uh, she previously served as principal at Ann Beha and Associates uh, Architects in Boston for 26 years, and she directed award-winning projects including the Courier Art Museum in Manchester, New Hampshire, transforming the Charles Street Jail into Boston's Liberty Hotel, and renovation of the Cambridge Public Library. Uh, she's also done projects in Maine, including the McClellan House and Sweat Galleries at the Portland Museum of Art, and also the adaptive reuse of a warehouse in Bangor as the University of Maine Museum of Art. Uh, Pam is a graduate of Williams College and has an architecture degree from uh, a degree in historic preservation from Columbia University and, and an architecture degree from the University of California at Berkeley. And she's got an incredible um, list of awards and um, board memberships, but I'll mention just two. She was a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and is currently on the board of the James Marston Fitch Foundation in New York and on the U.S. General Services Administration's National Register of Professional Peers. So this is our panel for this evening. So I'm really looking forward to, to uh, your remarks uh, uh, this evening. And we'll start, I think, with Lee. So welcome. Nice to see so many people here and a lot of, uh, I won't say old faces, long time faces. <laughs> uh, so much has happened in preservation since the 70s that, that uh, I couldn't really describe all of it and that's assuming I could even remember all of it. But what I'm going to do <clears throat> to limit my, what my presentation is to, it's called Observations on the Evolution of Historic Preservation Practice. I'm going to just tell you what I literally observed, what I saw with my own eyes, not what I heard about or anything like that. And I was very fortunate to be involved at a time when preservation had a lot of, uh, still does, but a lot of exciting issues. As Hillary said, I was born and raised in Portland, grew up here, joined the Navy literally, saw the world literally. Uh, came back in 1976 and with a much greater appreciation of the impact of place on people, on me, on people, and that seemed to mean something to me. But talk about Union Station, 1961, I did observe that in the newspaper. I was a sophomore in high school. I had some real important things on my mind like studies, girls, tennis, things like that. I did, Union Station didn't mean much to me, except I remembered waiting in the waiting room for my grandfather to come on the train. So you, I, I missed it. I missed it. Sort of like that Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I said, uh oh, I think that was something important. And that contributed. So after that demolition and coming back, I realized that build, excuse me, buildings do have an impact on place. And uh, after working uh, as a real estate lawyer for a couple of years and starting a family, I uh, signed up with Landmarks, got on the board, and Portland then and still is a great place where if you express an interest, <laughs> and that's sort of what they did to me. So <laughs> I got in the pipeline and I uh, joined up when Landmarks had just moved to State Street, uh, 
couple of doors out from St. Luke's, and it was a small place, crowded, jammed, filled with excitement, filled with great people, uh, wonderful people who were working hard. They were, some of them were pretty new to preservation like me. Some were the, the grand ladies like Franny Peabody. So you were rubbing shoulders with all kinds of people. But no one can do anything in preservation except as part of a team. And so that early Landmarks board was a, I felt, was a great team. I was very fortunate, again I say fortunate because all you have to do is say I'll do it and you get grabbed. So I started as chair of the Public Issues Committee, I think it was called Public Affairs, and then chair of the Revolving Fund uh, Committee and then ended up as a, as a president of uh, Landmarks. The Revolving Fund, uh, it's still around according to Chris, was trying to be very active. Uh, it was originally funded with some proceeds of a historic building, the whole Howe House, and then some federal grants, $40,000, I think. And the plan for a revolving fund is you have a pile of money, and you go out and you buy a building that no one else wants to buy, because it's in pretty sad shape. You fix it up, you find a buyer, usually you try to find the buyer before you bought the building, and you attach covenants and restrictions that, that help to, I keep whacking that, help to uh, get landmarks to have their foot in the door on maintenance and repair. Uh, that worked for a while, except that buildings started going up in prices, so we started just loaning the money. And we would loan the money to people who were doing rehabs when either the bank wasn't giving enough money or the interest rate was too high, we'd go in. We'd like to say we'd go in when no one else would fear to tread. We also felt that even if we ran out of money, that was good because we were going where no one else would go and at least we got buildings that were fixed up. Talk about fixing up a building with the revolving fund and a lot of other money. Uh, Landmarks got involved with the H.H. H. Hay building, and we all know about that, 1978. Uh, it was, no one wanted to buy it. Uh, it was an absolute wreck. Uh, the owner threatened to uh, open a Burger King franchise on the first floor. Uh, Fort Museum of Art was making some rumblings about moving maybe to the Libby building, but we didn't really know for sure, and the Libby building was right across from the Hay building. So a bunch of us at Landmark said, well, this is an obvious revolving fund money at that time a project. At that time, Joel Russ was the executive director, and he had an incredible knack of taking money from the, uh, getting money from the feds, <laughs> getting money from the state, and doing matches that match this, and therefore that would leverage this and leverage that. We used some uh, revolving fund money, and we went out to try to see what we could do. But before we could do that, we had to negotiate. I ended up being the negotiator with the buyer, but much to our surprise, I was the negotiator negotiating with the board of Landmarks. So uh, this was not an easy project for the board. Uh, this was a big project. We've never done anything like this. Uh, it was a very important project to the square, Congress Square, and it was a very public uh, project. This wasn't one of these things that was just down the alley. This was a centerpiece project. So there was a lot of debate on the board as to whether we should really do this. Was it really too risky? Ultimately, after many months, uh, a vote was taken and uh, we moved forward. Uh, at the time, we were also working with Doug Cardenny, who's here in the office, and his partner, Joe Bolas. And uh, they stepped up. And this was despite, I'm not sure if Doug knew this, despite we having a real estate appraisal that said, even if Landmarks did the exterior renovation, the appraisal said the value of that property is still minus $60,000. So it was a big step up. Did you know that, Doug? I'm sorry. It worked out. It worked out. <laughs> uh, so now, Landmarks is involved in more than just, you know, the small time historic preservation. We were really putting our money, um, our, we were walking the walk, talking the talk, doing things. And I think we gained a, a lot of respect. And I think as a result of that, we started working with the city of Portland. Uh, and I helped uh, with the team negotiate the lease for the Portland Observatory where Landmarks took over the maintenance and repair. And I think that was the first time that uh, now Landmarks had a very formal, mutually respectful uh, relationship with the city of Portland. 
1978, uh, many in the legal community, and I was a lawyer at that point, were aware of something coming down the pipeline called the Penn Central case. I'm not sure how many of you have heard it, and I won't bore you to tears with all of the details, but it formed the legal underpinnings for the Historic Preservation Ordinance and for historic preservation really throughout the United States. Basically, it was the Penn Central Transportation Company owned Grand Central Terminal and wanted to build a 55-story building above it to get more value out of the property. The New York Landmarks Commission said, mm -mm, no, that's not going to work. They had declared it a landmark already. Uh, Penn Central appealed here and there. Ultimately, it went to uh, the New York Supreme Court, which held in their favor and said that because Landmark Commission had named it a landmark and had said no, it had decreased the value of private property. In other words, it had taken private property without just compensation. And that's not allowed in the U.S. Constitution, and that's the way it should be. After that case, we in the preservation community, the legal community, were saying, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Went to the U.S. Supreme Court, 1978, William Brennan, Justice William Brennan, in a six to three decision, basically held, yep, the city can do that. The city can designate something as a landmark and have restrictions. He wrote the following, just so you understand exactly what the question was. The question presented is whether a city may, as part of a comprehensive program to preserve historic landmarks and historic districts, think historic preservation ordinance, place restrictions on the development of individual landmarks in addition to those imposed by zoning without affecting a taking, without taking property. Can you have something that says, no, you can't do that to your private property? Is that a taking? The court said, not necessarily. What the community has to do has to make real sure that that building or that area or that district has a public benefit. And it also really has to safeguard the rights of private property. So it's a, it's a balancing. It's a balancing. Yes, you can if you do this. To say the preservation community was elated would be an understatement because we now had the tool. Justice Brennan had said, historic preservation contributes to quality of life. It in, he said, it, in, it enhances the quality of life for all. So figured we're not home free, but now's the time for the historic preservation ordinance. Two months later, the then city council said no and voted it down. We had to try again because we had to have an ordinance because without standards in the zoning ordinance, which really weren't speaking then specifically to historic properties, or to building committees, uh, building uh, codes, which have always been woefully behind uh, work on historic properties. Without those standards, landmarks and other preservations couldn't really have any say, any standing, any right to stand in front of planning boards and say, I don't think that's a good idea. But a historic preservation ordinance did come. It came long after. There's much debate, much controversy, countless drafts. I happen to think that as a result of landmarks with their work with the H.H. Hay Building, with the Portland Observatory, that landmarks, we had some credibility that we knew a bit about private property because we had gotten involved with Doug and Joe Bolas uh, on a massive bit of private property, and it all worked out. We were definitely at the table negotiating over and over and we had people, we had Deb here, we were providing information. We had National Trust, we were providing information from other localities throughout the country. And then in 1990, it passed. It passed with a lot of compromises. Uh, some of them are being made up for now, but a lot of compromises to get a historic preservation ordinance. One which is hardly a compromise, but we were the historic preservation committee. We were not the preservation board. Heaven forbid, we couldn't think of ourselves as a planning board or the historic preservation board, and certainly not a commission, when in fact, nationally, most of them were called preservation commissions. Whoop, we said, that's fine. I get too excited. That's fine. We said, we can live with that. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be the chair of the first historic preservation committee, 
And I think we denied only one application in the two years that I was, uh, I was chair. Uh, people were wondering, would it be fair? Will we be strict? How consistent would we be? And I always felt that we were laying the keel for the rest of uh, the practice of preservation on the committee now board, I'm pleased to say. We had a committee made up of people who really did listen, who really responded appropriately. There was a lot of back and forth, give and take. And I think, although we never said it, it was, and you hear this phrase more and more, that we didn't let perfect become the enemy of good. But we knew that good was good. Good was not just good enough. So there was a lot of back and forth. And the one that we did deny just didn't want any back and forth. So that's how that worked. I think we, Deb may remember how many, but we had a lot of applications and I still drive around and they, they still work. Then came the Merrill Auditorium. That was a project that was completed in uh, 1993. Uh, I was involved in something called CARES, C A. R-E-S, which was standing for Citizens for the Auditorium Restoration. And it was filled with people. I was a Johnny come lately. Again, I was one of these things who said, two minutes, who said, uh, I'd, I'd like to help out. And so I ended up helping out. And uh, we raised the enthusiasm in the community. That led to the city council uh, voting for a bond that was critical, necessary to continue funding. Uh, I was also on the building committee, which came up with uh, a world-class acoustician and a local architect who came up with a plan because the idea was to make the hall acoustically almost perfect for the organ, for the symphony, for people coming. So we had a world-class acoustician. Great plan, but great plan acoustically, but design-wise, but no, that's the only plan. That's it. That's all you can have. That's, if you want to have acoustics, it's got to... Mm -mm which involved taking out balconies and doing a lot of other things. So I remember standing in the, what was then the first balcony of the Merrill, showing it to the preservation community, seven or eight people, and uh, they didn't have glazed eyes and their jaws didn't drop, but they might as well have, and they left. And they came back months later with something called the Second Opinion Committee. They found a world-class acoustician and a local architect and that's what you see. That's what you see now. I have a painting of what it would have been, but I was sort of too embarrassed to bring that one. Uh, what you see is what you get. And I think every one of us who w still walks in, as I do, and my jaw does drop out of joy, we have the Second Opinion Committee to thank for that. Uh, 1999, uh, with the approval of the city manager and the city council, I became uh, economic Development Director, and then uh, we combined two departments, and I became the Planning and Development Director. The first department was the Economic Development Department, and the other one was then called the Planning and Urban Development Department. The urban wasn't going to work, except for my mother. And I became the Planning and Development uh, Department. The idea was to, to promote communication and not confrontation, instead of having economic development bumping into the planners and all of that it was to sit down. And I think it worked. I think we got some things done. Uh, I thought we got a lot of stuff done. Uh, we'll see how that turns out. Another totally different observation, and I'm wrapping up. I talked about the hay building. Whoop. Talked about the hay building. Merrill Auditorium. All these fascinating products. You know, from another, it doesn't need Sorry, okay. Uh, it doesn't need to be a big project. I think one of the secret sleeper projects in Portland is the Boothby Square Fountain. I don't think many people know it was here for years. It disappeared. I'm skipping over a lot of facts. And it reappeared. And it's a perfect example of the collaboration between public and private things happened. Uh, I kept notes, it's about this thick, of what it was involved to get that Boothby Square. Not by me, by all of us working on it. So it doesn't have to be a major project. If you don't notice it, that's good. It's because it's just part of the landscape. Well, it wasn't for many years. 
Uh, Miss Fortin Diner, my favorite place. Miss Fortin Diner. A diner got moved, public private, community. How many meetings uh, do I see down at the, you know, in a booth at the Miss Fortin Diner? So that works. So where are we now? Uh, I'm going to defer to Pam, who's going to try to wrap everything up. But I, I would say two things. I think the concept of historic preservation has expanded far beyond historic and far beyond preservation. Far beyond that. We do much more than that. And secondly, I think that's good. I think that's very good. I think it's good for everyone here, including myself, who live, play, and, and work in our great city. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. You did it. We said we'd have fun, and so you've, you've led us off on the right foot. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> in preparing for this, I felt a little bit like uh, I was attending an appearance on This Was Your Life. Uh, I, uh, I've been in this field a long time, and to concentrate uh, on a presentation like this, and to look back 40 years, and to consult various manuscripts, documents, the internet, photographs, some of myself, um, was a bit alarming, but at the same time uh, reminds me of a couple of things that need to be said tonight. And one is, is that uh, um, we're now looking at what had been a movement, at least in the early days, I'm, I'm saying the early days because I got into the field in the early 70s. What was a movement is now a profession and a professional discipline. I think it's actually arrived at that point so that we can safely say that. Um, I want to uh, first lead off, I'm, I'm actually breaking stride here and I'm going to try to pick up the pace as I move along, but I want to pay a tribute to women. Um, as I uh, went through the, uh, the background and looked at not only the last 40 years, but all the way back to Anne Pamela Cunningham in the mid-19th century, um, it, it can't be said often enough that the influence of women in this field has been both um, significant and dramatic at times, and it continues. And I wish I had statistics tonight to be able to tell you what the preponderance of women is in our field today. Uh, I, I have a feeling it's uh, it's at the break-even point with the men that have been in the field, but uh, I, I think you are actually growing in numbers, and um, I think that's um, been a powerful force for us over time for lots of reasons. A couple of other things I wanted to say before I get into the body of this. Um, preservation's agenda is now a part of everyone else's agenda, or if not everyone else, the people that we were aiming at, certainly beginning in the 60s and 70s. That's an advancement. That's success. I hear that in meetings that I go to, at the planning department, at the economic development department, at Merida, at the library, lots of places. I want to reinforce something that Lee said in a little different way. Um, in the early days, preservationists had to be uh, rather aggressive sorts and be willing to, to get out there in front of often heavy machinery. Um, but I think looking back, we can say now that um, the difference between having to be right and simply being accurate and correct is a subtle one, but one we might think about as we negotiate our way forward and draw victories where once they were thought to be difficult to attain. Uh, finally, um, this is the anecdotal section, um, the people in preservation. Um, think about it. Haven't some of the greatest characters you've met been preservationists? All right, 
I'm going to get into the, the serious part of this that sounds like an ancient history professor. Um, before I do that, one last um, thought. <coughs> the, um, one of the things I wanted to be able to do in summarizing my piece of this today uh, was to be able to say to you, this is the vanguard now. This is the spear point of our activity, of our thrust into social affairs, into architecture, into planning, engineering. I was not able to do that. There are too many. But I will say, um, and, and that's because preservation has become increasingly diversified, and Pam's going to talk about that in her remarks, so I won't steal her thunder. But um, I'm going to come close by saying that the leading edge today is, is probably in real estate activity, things like revolving funds, which are used extensively by nonprofits, uh, and to a lesser degree, but as importantly, particularly in places where you're unable to create a historic district for political reasons, is the instrument of the preservation easement. That is a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with an owner, which can sometimes save the building, even if the district fails to be designated. Okay, now let me jump into this. This was intended, the, the, the uh, title of our presentation tonight was intended to pick up where Greg Paxton and Jack Bauman left off uh, last fall. And uh, Greg, uh, both Greg and Jack um, ended up in the late 60s, and uh, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap here in my slides, uh, but um, uh, that's what we're going to try to do, um, do a little bit of taking account of where we've been, um, something of a measured critique of what was tried and perhaps didn't succeed too well, and then some of the things uh, that we would uh, acknowledge as tentative victories, uh, which uh, may yet to be may uh, are yet to be concluded. So I, I recall um, in 1976, first being presented with a definition for the then emerging field uh, discipline of historic preservation. Chester Leibs, who was uh, a Columbia graduate uh, and ended up being the founding director of the University of Vermont program, in which I was enrolled at the time, said and I'm paraphrasing here to keep it short. Historic preservation is a planning tool for managing change. And that's stuck with me for the better part of the last 35 years, and there's much in that that is unsaid but embodied in that simple statement, portions of which I hope to examine this evening. <clears throat> Over time, my views have broadened as I've labored in the fields of both community planning and preservation. In preparing for this evening, it occurred to me that historic preservation, one might argue, to use an aviation metaphor, of all things, has been the necessary trailing edge of America's manifest destiny. It's the instrument which records and preserves the story in the physical realm of the turbulence and backwash of the tectonic cultural shift of westward expansion that we recognize today as our national experience, the one that was preceded by the colonial experience. It is also the planning instrument which we used presently to protect, maintain, interpret, and reutilize the physical artifacts of our built environment, which interprets the settlement of an entire continent and marks the country's advancement and growth at the local, state, and national levels. Manifest Destiny was a bold, new world experiment which gained momentum following the close of the American Revolution and extended to 1890 when the U.S. government declared that the western frontier was now closed. <clears throat> now the frontier of space confronts us. From Lewis and Clark's expedition of 1803 to the gold rush in 1849 and all of the other land rushes which followed, the great en masse migration, many of them immigrants, was predicated upon the notion of unlimited land, water, energy, minerals, timber, and human labor combined with the growing technology and capital associated with rapid industrialization. And yes, the displacement and extinguishment of the Native American culture and its way of life. Now, with hindsight, just over a century later, in light of rising environmental costs that we find we are incurring, is the growing realization that manifest destiny, while arguably inevitable at that time, was likely founded 
absent a plan for careful stewardship upon the false premise of endless bounty. Our still developing comprehension and the cost of this continental phenomenon continu <clears throat> continues to manifest itself today only more locally in the contemporary land use pattern we have dubbed suburbanization, or less affectionately, sprawl, and its close associate within the more urban social context, gentrification. One of the most important observations about preservation that I wish to convey this evening regarding the period of focus, 1970 to the present, is the notion of convergence, and in particular the convergence of the relatively recent sustainability movement with the principles, values, and practices of preservation. Increasingly, our public secondary educational institutions have de-emphasized and sidetracked the disciplines of history and art further into a subordinated zone of popular irreverence in favor of promoting, understandably on a technical level, STEM-oriented study tracks, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But we need both. <clears throat> the folly of this policy has shortchanged, in my opinion, much of the collective national memory for at least a generation, if not more. Collective memory and informed citizenry is a critical shared intellectual resource, one essential to the maintenance of our democratic form of government. The very essence of our jurisprudence depends upon the social memory, as does averting dissent into social chaos. My second point, an admonition really, and made more poignant by the observance of the 50th anniversary of the formation of Greater Portland Landmarks this year, is that those of us in the fields of preservation, planning, and architecture, to name just a few, as well as our community leaders, have a solemn duty and an added responsibility in our respective professions. This responsibility extends beyond administration of our codes, our zoning ordinances, our building conservation standards, <clears throat> and reaches across into community attitudes and resource use policy making. We call this leadership. We must assure our children, our neighbors, our fellow citizens, our visitors, even the world community, through both education and exemplary decision making, that our contemporary and future practices in the planning and management of our built environment, those resources recognized and recalled in our historic downtowns, districts, neighborhoods, sites, structures, buildings, landscapes, objects, and monuments, are seen not only as enlightened but inclusive as well as innovative, and perhaps most importantly, sustainable by future generations. <clears throat> if we will not help lead, then who will? In the time I have remaining, I'd like to examine some of the uh, salient factors which I think characterize the rapid growth of this field uh, after 1970, uh, a field that we have begun to rename now as simply preservation rather than historic preservation. Catchy, eh? So, uh, let me see if I can manage the uh, screen in front of me. Um, there we go. So, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this part. The overlap period that I'm calling it, from 1949 to about 1970. Let's look at a couple of the things that happened. The National Trust for Historic Preservation was chartered by the Congress as the only, and the still only, sole uh, private sector preservation organization at the national level. Two minutes, thank you. <clears throat> Some other things happened. In 1949, the American Housing Act was passed. Uh, that created urban renewal, which had a more than lengthy life that many were happy to see expire in 1986. Um, you can look at some of the numbers and the magnitude of that program and some of the, uh, the damage that it was considered to have wrought. That being said, it was certainly founded in, with good intentions. Um, here's an example. Um, this was uh, probably the pinnacle of urban renewal thinking in 1952, the construction of the 33 buildings complex of the Pruitt-Igo Towers in uh, St. Louis, um, designed by a modernist architect, Minoru Yamasaki. Uh, sad to say that um, he and his firm were also the architects of the World Trade Center. <clears throat> the 
advancements in the period of 1964 to 70 were also significant. We saw the, public, the publication of the, uh, the book With Heritage So Rich by the National Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this had a direct bearing on uh, the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act, probably the single most important piece of legislation affecting our field in 1966. It created the National Register of Historic Places. It created Section 106 Review. It set up the structure for the state and local partnership that we have today, which has stood the test of time. We also saw the passage of the National Transportation Act in the same year, uh, and without going into any detail on that, I'll just say that Section 4F, the parallel piece of uh, uh, segment of legislation in that act, uh, was uh, included in, in that uh, passage of that statute. And then finally, the capstone of many of our experiences of going through Earth Day, the passage of the National Environmental Policy Act in 1970, which for the first time included at, the, at, the, at a national level <clears throat> the requirement that one must take account in, in projects that require a, an environmental impact statement, one must take account of historical resources. Post-1970 events. This was a very prolific period between 1972 and 1986. In fact, I will say to you that my talk tonight is weighted toward that end of the spectrum rather than the 90s and into the uh, end of this century. Um, among those was Nixon signing the first of the executive orders that uh, brought the other federal agencies into line um, following their uh, reluctance to observe um, the um, the specifications of the, uh, the Act of 1966. Executive Order 1153 um, was later, along with other executive orders, folded into the uh, Code of Federal Re Regulations that we have today that uh, regulate <coughs> the practice of preservation at the federal level. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation established its system of regional offices throughout the country in 1974, which later grew to six offices nationwide. Um, on the economic front, we saw the tax reform of 1976 enacted. For the first time, this leveled the playing field between rehabilitation and new construction. It eliminated deductions for demolition and it put in place accelerated depreciation for a rehabilitation of properties that were listed in the National Register of Historic Places. That's probably the, one of the most single revolutionary events that we have in the last 40 years. Lee has mentioned the Penn Central case. All I will say in addition to that is, is that it's been challenged numerous times, but it stood the test of time. In 1977, the, um, the National Trust published this poster, partly in reaction to the 1973-74 oil crisis, which we suffered um, and many of us remember. Uh, it's a very poignant uh, look at what buildings do. Am I out of time? Okay. Um, how will I do this? Okay. So we'll show you the Pruitt Igo Towers. I'll give you a minute, Hillary, I'll wrap it up. Now this is what became of that complex. It didn't survive but 20 years before they took down all 33 buildings because of the flawed social engineering and to some degree the architecture that went into the construction of the complex. In 1980, Main Street was launched. You, you'll have to read some of these things so I can speed right along. Uh, you can see the growth of that program. Um, this is one of the things that I want to point out that, was, that inspired the concept of, concept of what I will call incrementalism, taking things one step at a time in small bites. And that's how successes were built. The um, period of the 80s was a, was a boom period following the close of the recession of 81, which was rather short. Uh, we saw that the federal tax law was changed again, this time to create a 25% tax credit. I just want you to look at some of those numbers, the order of magnitude from 1976 to now, the billions that have been spent on 38,000 historic properties uh, that have been rehabilitated. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the charitable deduction for preservation easements, but that's been important as well. Uh, it all slowed down in 86, just before that recession. I'm old enough now where I can actually start to look at my life in terms of the recessions. <laughs> Somebody said once, you haven't really lived yet until you've been through a full economic cycle. Well, I think I qualify now. Uh, so after 86, the tax credit program survived, but it slowed down because it eliminated a class of investors that had fueled the program for the first seven or eight years. Pleased to say that I was a participant in one of the first tax credit programs in the nation, the, bank, the rehabilitation of the Bangor House, 
in this state in 1979. Um, okay, I'm going to let you read that. Trends, this is my last slide, Hillary. <clears throat> um, here's where I think we've, we've been. His, this is the shift that's occurred. Uh, we've gone from individual sites to thinking now more globally in terms of districts. Uh, who knows where we go from here? Maybe we'll start thinking more about whole regional landscapes. Uh, decentralization and re regionalism, that's been key at both the National Park Service level and with the National Trust. It's created <clears throat> and spurred the growth of state and local historic preservation entities, Greater Portland Landmarks being one of them. Women in preservation, I can't say enough about that. Incrementalism I've mentioned. Um, this, is a, this is an odd drag on the entire field. Full funding for the National Historic Preservation Act, which was mandated to use offshore gas and oil leases on the East Coast to, to fuel the program has been an elusive pursuit. It's never been fully funded in all the years that we've had the funding for it. And finally, education and jobs, both growing in the field. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. It's such a pleasure to be here. I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, and I can remember walking down Congress Street as a teenager with the locally owned fine clothing stores like Porches and Benoit's and W.T. Grant's and three movie theaters. Um, of course, I also know that dining out consisted of steak, lobster, and spaghetti. I came back to Portland after graduating from college in 1976, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and volunteered for Landmarks, um, laying out their newsletter and designing some of their brochures. Um, and then I left for 40 years, um, going to graduate school, working around the country. And so it's been really a lot of fun. Um, and then and came back here as a permanent resident just um, two years ago and started a new firm. Um, so this panel has really been a nice chance to think about um, how Portland has changed since I left and also how preservation has changed since I entered the field. Um, and a lot of fun to hear the perspectives that both Lee and Chris have shared as well. They've set such a nice background that I thought what I might do is to really um, dwell more on the philosophical, um, think a little bit about um, what we're preserving and why we're doing it. Since the rescue of Mount Vernon in eight, the 1850s, the first 100 years of preservation were really focused on saving single-family houses, and the solution was to make them museums. It's easy to see why Margaret Mussey Sweat, one of those women in preservation, um, donated the McClellan Mansion to the Portland Society of Art in 1912. It stands on a prominent corner, it was associated with important people. Uh, I would add typically wealthy, Anglo-Saxon, and male. And it was an, it's an outstanding example of federal period architecture. It was the best. Union Station was a wake-up call that everyday buildings are significant. And the renovation of the H.H. Hay building and the Thomas Block demonstrated that they could be commercially viable too. Now, as Chris has mentioned, we've expanded our focus to boats and bridges, neighborhoods and cultural landscapes, um, and have recognized those by listing on the National Register. But as important as the kinds of buildings that we're saving are the people that they represent. Over the past four decades, we've discovered places that where Native Americans and African Americans, Irish and Italians, factory workers and jazz singers lived, worked, and worshipped. The Abyssinian meet, uh, meeting house on Munjoy Hill is really a wonderful example of this. It's a real contrast to the McClellan Mansion. I think it was built to be low-key and kind of under the radar. Um, it's a vernacular building that's been much altered and well and hard used. A generation ago, it might have slipped away 
and taken with it the remarkable stories of generations of Portland's African American citizens. Portland in 2014 is much more diverse than it was 50 years ago in terms of race, religion, and language. How can Portland's heritage empower recent immigrants from Cambodia and Vietnam, Somalia and the Soviet Union? And how will their contributions be marked in the years to come? Digital technology is making everyone's histories more accessible and more engaging. We've come a long way since the days when I used uh, rubber cement to paste up typewritten copy and my own ink, pen and ink drawings to create every month's Landmarks Observer. History isn't confined to books. Via the web, people are gaining access to historical and technical data that was once reserved for the experts. And they're creating their own stories in the process. In this interactive age, standing behind a velvet rope and listening to a docent's tour has become much less satisfying. So has schlepping guidebooks around. Imagine standing on a street corner and pulling out your phone and discovering the history of nearby landmarks with historic photographs, with alternate viewpoints, maybe music of the period or even the voices of the owners themselves. It's already happening. The T Portland's uh, Public Art C Committee has created a wonderful new website, and the, uh, there will be QR codes on the sculptures that you can uh, hold your phone up to to learn more about the, the sculptures and the history of their design. New Orleans has an app for the architectural history, which you can download for $2.99. And uh, what's out there is another app from the, cult from the um, Cultural Landscape Foundation that allows access to a growing database of, of information about uh, cultural landscapes all around the country. Chris told me that he's using Google Earth to do preliminary architectural surveys of historic districts, uh, what we used to call windshield surveys when we did them in automobiles. And it's only a matter of time before sites like greatbuildings.com will enable you to walk through the Paris' Saint-Chapelle without leaving the comfort of your Portland living room, although I would uh, add that the opportunities for um, fine dining afterwards may, well, I should say, they may even be as good as Paris. Um, it may become another way of preserving historic sites and maybe allowing us to experience them after they've been demolished. New media can build support for preservation. How might they influence what and how we preserve? Art can also shine a light on the past. Artists have been important players in Portland's preservation. First, by making the old port fashionable, then by keeping Congress Street going in the 1980s and 90s. It's a phenomenon that's not unique to Portland. In 1968, just a few years after our um, starting point here, Donald Judd purchased 101 Spring Street in New York, a 19th century cast iron loft building. It was the start of a phenomenon that's made lofts synonymous with contemporary art and then with hip retail restaurants and boutique hotels. Today, it's the only intact, single-use cast iron building remaining in Soho. The it's the headquarters of Judd's private foundation and also one of the founding sites in the National Trust's program called Historic Artists Homes and Studios, a nationwide consortium that also includes the Winslow Homer Studio here in Maine. Equally important, artists can offer unique and powerful insights into historic sites. The Eastern State Penitentiary, a National Historic Landmark, was constructed in 1828 but abandoned in the 1970s. It's been open to the public since the 1990s and preserved largely as a ruin. The nonprofit that operates it has used art installations as a way to explore the site's history, making connections with today's criminal justice system, 
and humanizing the very challenging subjects of punishment and incarceration. I was really um, so excited to see uh, the Biennale at the Portland Museum last fall where the rooms of the McClellan House, Margaret Mussey's drawing room, um, was used for art installations. How exciting might it be to have artists create temporary installations that would focus attention on the buildings and sites that are included in Landmark's most endangered list every year. Portland's become more creative in the 21st century. Chefs and sculptors, clothing and web designers are all helping fuel our economy. Artists have been preservationists, and preservation has become more inclusive. But preservation activities often threaten artists, immigrants, and other low-income residents. In Portland, like so many other cities, artists and immigrants tended to settle in the least desirable and least expensive areas. Typically, those were the areas that had the oldest and the most poorly maintained buildings. They also were typically the first targets of urban renewal, like the Franklin Arterial. The India Street area still shows traces of the Italian and Jewish immigrants that were displaced in the 1960s. What will happen to the residents of the East End, Bayside, and other neighborhoods when the middle class moves in? Must preservation always equal gentrification? Project Row Houses in Houston, Texas, demonstrates that you can support preservation artists and low-income residents, too. Um, this included 22 shotgun houses built in the 1930s as tenant shacks. They were derelict by the 1990s when they were bought by artist Rick Rowe and a coalition of others with seed money from the National Endowment for the, Human, for the Arts and private foundations. Corporations and volunteers uh, added their labor and it's become a public art project that integrates artists and, and the families that have lived there for 100 years. It offers eight houses for visiting artists, as well as a home for uh, single mothers who are trying to finish their education, and new housing designed by uh, architecture students from Rice University nearby. The formula has been such a success that it's expanding far beyond its five blocks to other parts of the city, too. In Portland, projects like the North School, St. Dominic's, and many others have shown that with preservation and housing tax credits um, and other programs, re rehabilitation can preserve neighborhoods and the low-income families that live there. Like Portland, preservation is more creative than it was 50 years ago. The options are not just restoration and preservation, but adaptive reuse and much freer transformation, transformations of the historic fabric, um, something that Europe has been uh, doing for, de for not just decades, but centuries. Schwartz Silver's uh, addition and renovation to the Maine Historical Society a few years ago is a great example of distinctive contemporary design as a companion to a landmark. So is Scott Simon's transformation of this building, which is not a historic building, but certainly ser uh, stands as a landmark. In the uh, Mercado Santa Catarina in Barcelona is a um, very exuberant example of this. Um, architects Enrique Morales and Benedetta Talabue transformed a mid-19th century market building in the middle of one of Barcelona's um, worst slums. They retained the masonry walls and some of the roof trusses, but not all of it. Inside, there are about 60 market stalls intermixed with cafes, restaurants, and community services, bringing new life to the whole area. This large, comp the entire complex is uh, covered with this wonderful undulating um, metal tile roof. It's clearly contemporary, but it's also contextual. The red, yellow, and green hexagons echo the colorful vegetable split displays within, and the robust structural system, uh, for me, really recalls the um, wonderful um, 
epic and expressive vaulting of Antonin Gaudí's Sagrada Familia, which is such a landmark in Barcelona. It's been embraced by the local community uh, and even become a local icon reproduced on travel posters and buses. Landmarks are becoming more youthful, um, while at the same time more challenging. Um, as this month's Preservation Magazine reminds us, modernism is one of the next frontiers. Organizations like Daca Momo have called attention to the modernist res resources and masterpieces in our own backyard. In my case, a Marcel Breuer house just a few doors down from the Colonial Revival house that I grew up in in Cape Elizabeth. Haystack is a modernist icon that I think we all admire, and it's no surprise that it was placed on the National Register in 2005, when it, uh, even before it became 50 years old. But not everyone loves modernism. It's hard for me to believe that something built in my lifetime can actually be historic. Buildings from the 1950s and 60s are also pose technical challenges. They're often built of materials that haven't stood the test of time, um, and their uh, envelopes and their mechanical systems are far from sustainable. The Houston Bakery, um, which we see in the foreground of this view from the, 19, um, the 1960s, was uh, designed by a nationally prominent industrial designer, Albert Kahn. Amid a great deal of controversy, it became the USM Library in 1991. The structure was preserved, but its appearance was dramatically altered. With enhanced appreciation and technical knowledge, would we have done the same thing today? And I have to think about what might be the fate of this car dealership um, now the U-Haul headquarters, built in 1963 when cars were really the expression of the American dream, and Marginal Way was pretty hot. I think um, I end with a question, um, because I think landmarks need to make room for the future. Our preservation needs to make room for the landmarks of the future. Um, Lee talked about the loss of the Libby Building um, and the its replacement with the Portland Museum of Art, which I think we all agree was a good equation. If Portland's to be a vibrant, evolving city, preservationists have to recognize, promote, and support great contemporary design. And contemporary designers need to learn from preservation and history, which is not something that happens very often in design schools. Landmark's 50th anniversary photo exhibit is entitled images of change, and it's a reminder that preservation can't stop change, nor should it be, nor should it, if it wants to be, remain relevant. But I think it can help ensure that our city has the best possible future, one that's sustainable, equitable, inspiring, and meaningful for everyone. We have a few minutes for questions with us, with our great pals. Anybody would like to throw out something for a discussion? Do I see anybody? Um, I, I had sort of a question, maybe, which would might be a summer, summation thing, which would be, what do you think the biggest challenge for preservation is in greater Portland? And then sort of put that into a broader context, internationally or nationally. I mean, is, is it something, you, know, you raised a lot of good points, Pam, but. Um, in the in the in the in the greater Portland area, what do you think is the big challenge, biggest challenge for for this this field? I mean, I think it's to be relevant to everyone. I think preservation has been so much um, of something that's focused on a, a really small segment of our population, and I think that Portland is really changing. I think that's the most exciting thing. Um, and I think preservation really needs to begin to think about how it um, is relevant to um, a much wider group of people. Um, I'd take a, a slightly different view and say that um, the challenge of energy going forward 
is starting to be and will continue to be a very large challenge, particularly for um, older and spacious buildings. Um, this is not just about saving oil or keeping warm. We're now beginning to see a spread in the real estate market between buildings that are highly energy efficient and the values, the fair market values of those properties compared to other comparable buildings which have not received energy efficiency improvements. If that spreads to the neighborhoods, I'm talking about commercial buildings now, if that spreads to the neighborhoods, we're all in trouble. So one of the suggestions that I would have would be that the National Park Service and those who safeguard our ordinances at the state and local level, building codes as well as historic district ordinances, need to take a fresh and serious look about how we're going to confront the challenge of addressing rising energy costs. One of the things that will come up will be <clears throat> how do we incorporate alternative energy equipment on historic buildings that are protected under current ordinances by virtue of their exterior architectural appearance and detail. Back in the day, when in Portland you could buy a building in the old port for $4,500, um, you could put a lot of sweat equity into a building and, and rehabilitate it. What are the opportunities for young people or grassroots activism in preservation today? It's different. What are the opportunities for young people to get involved in? In the old days, you'd find a wreck of a building, come up with $2,500, and, 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 and go at it. But what, what do you do today when you can't, when you, there's a lot that's been taken already? I, uh my experience, again, this personal experience, I have four kids, four adult children, uh, and they all want to come back uh, to Portland, and uh, they really can't. If, uh, I won't name the town that my daughter said, but she said, Dad, do I have to live in? And think of something about 40 miles away from Portland. Uh, and I think uh, there are enough uh, far better real estate people than me in this room, but uh, the pricing, what we've found, I've found, I live in a, in a, I have some neighbors here in historic houses, and even if they are the, you know, the uh, handyman special, we used to call them, the price reflects, oh, I know what you're going to do, and I know you're going to be able to turn this into some, you know, really increase the value, so I want to get a piece of that value now. So uh, I think it's very difficult to find those handyman specialists now. I would just opine as a footnote to that, that I think we're going to see more of the phenomenon known as co-housing or community housing, uh, particularly for the elderly. Uh, but I would guess that the younger folks will respond to that concept equally as well. Uh, there's no other way to finance it. You, you need more partners when the prices are this high. Thank you, Pam. I think that's a great uh, place to go to our final thing this evening. We have a very special discovery that uh, Lee Urban and um, is going to, and Doug Cardetti is going to uh, share with us. This has to do with the Hay Building and that uh, bold move that uh, Lee uh, and the board decided to take uh, at great risk. And we all have those moments on boards trying to figure out that right move. Are we? going to risk and what are we going to do and, and um, is it going to turn out to be a, a good outcome or not and certainly the Hay Building has been a great outcome and so I'm going to invite Lee and Doug to step forward with this interesting and special thing they discovered to share with you. Come on, uh, I'm going to let uh, Doug introduce himself uh, but uh, when you go into an old building, let's face it, the fun part is to walk through the basement before the renovation begins and see what you can find there. And uh, I didn't get down to the basement as fast as Doug did. And <laughs> so he did the renovations. And so Doug, would it, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I'm and Doug Cardenti, and uh, I was one of the unfortunate people that got involved in the A building. <laughs> it was $60,000 less? Less, yes. You made up for it. Okay. 
Well, uh, I can remember when uh, Lee approached uh, Joe and myself with the idea of doing a hay building, it's hard to think back that nobody was interested. We weren't interested. It was like, are, are you serious? You know, and uh, like uh, Lee had said, the museum wasn't really there yet, and the building had broken windows, and all of the nice architecture had been weathered, and that particular building is so narrow, like a flat iron, as there were three staircases in it to begin with, <clears throat> we had to add a fourth and because of exits, no elevators. It was a neat building, but it was basically functionally obsolete. Um, but in any event, we said, well, when Lee started crying, that kind of got us. <laughs> we took, took pity on him. And we really didn't know what we were doing, but we did it, and it worked out well. Um, but. Um, in the process, the first thing we needed to do was to clean it out to see what the heck we had. And so you climbed up these very narrow staircases. And um, years ago, that's where all their accounting department and marketing department for the H HHA organization had more than just that building. There was on this, one in the south end, this, uh, east end, and I think some others. And. Uh, over time, it had dwindled down to being just the corner drugstore on the bottom floor, selling mostly cigarettes and gum, I think. And uh, But upstairs was just a collection of anything that they didn't need anymore, they threw it upstairs. And sadly to say, they were just piles of all those cardboard cutouts of the Alka-Seltzer boy. And all that. I mean, just so many. If there was one, you would say, gee, we ought to keep that. But there were tons of them. And, and so we just had the guys pick it up and throw it out the window, sadly to say. And on the floor up there was this. And uh, so I picked it up and I'm looking at it. And uh, it's uh, Edward Hayes, uh, licensed to be a pharmacist, which was granted to him on February 8, 1888. And uh, so I said, well, I guess I'll keep this. And because there's only one of them. And, uh, so I don't think there's any more around, and uh, so we saved it, and I'd like to present it to Landmarks. And uh, as you can tell, if it wasn't for Lee, the Hay Building would have been gone. Really, Lee Urban uh, saved that building, and he deserves a lot of credit for it. And that's the truth. Thank you very much for coming this evening. If you'd like to take a look at the certificate, we'll have it be up here on the stage. We appreciate your attendance tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you for Deb Andrews' talk on February 25th right here at 6 o'clock. Thanks again.